What up, everybody? This is Chef Jack Aaron at the uh, Talk Team Podcast. This is Jade with the Jessica Northrup team from Denver, Colorado, and you are listening to the Real Talk Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Real Talk Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Today, I am honored to have Tony Capper, who is uh, part of us, our team at Compass. He is the co-founder and COO of Contextually a national relationship-based CRM platform that was acquired by Compass early 2019. Prior to the acquisition, Tony had led contextually to $12 million in venture capital backing, 75 employees, and tens of thousands of customers, including myself, and also a top uh, eight of the top 20 real estate brokerages in the country. Tony currently serves as the head of lead gen and strategic growth at Compass. Ultimately, his responsibility is increasing our revenue uh, by 25% year over year. He's an MIT alum with a BS in management science. Tony loves hiking, camping, and actually had a great long conversation about his uh, fan of beers and breweries throughout the nation. You've been to how many? Two, over 200, you said? Yeah, over 200 wi- wineries and breweries. Oh, wineries and breweries, yeah. okay. Not, not, not an exclusive <laughs> beer guy, but yeah. So yeah, I would say he is the one percenter, uh, just like a uh, triathlon athlete. Uh, he currently lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife and two children. So, Tony, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. And welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So so just to jump right on in, uh, tell, just tell us a little bit about your uh, early start at Contactually. Did you, I know it wasn't your technically your first startup, correct? So I've worked on – I've been starting – little things for forever um, and that had you know side businesses since high school it's the first venture back company yeah. that, I, that I started um, okay. and it was, it was me uh, myself and a third co-founder Jeff and long story short the three of us had never met before came together decided that there should be a product in the world that helps you stay better connected with your the people you know and can actually you know came out of that uh-huh. uh, your background was in uh, was at Microsoft prior to you were there yeah, for two right. years yeah. did did he specifically, did you guys partner up specifically based on what you had learned at Microsoft to start Contactually? No, or it was, was completely it? random, completely random. So, which is, in hindsight, if I was going to bet on a team, I would have never bet on this. So we had never worked together, we no. never like, went to go to school together. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't, yeah. No, I, I randomly reached out to Zvi. Zvi had been living in D.C. for a number of years, I've been here for only a year. Mm-hmm. And I basically said, look, I'm, I'm here, I'm thinking of maybe starting a company or would love to partner with someone to maybe to build something together. And um, that's how we got connected, completely cold email. Wow. grabbed uh, a few coffees and lunches yeah. and realized we were in sort of the same stage in our lives where we thought we'd want to start something and took right. it from there. Got it. Uh, what were some of your challenges? I mean, just like any startup, you know, we all have challenges. I was in Urban Compass. There was, I was for, I brought the first sales this thing. You couldn't even put in a real estate tax. There's like no like system for sure. sales this thing. There's a lot of growing pains, right? What, yeah. what were some of your uh, challenges you had as, as you guys were getting, kind of getting to know each other and gel as a company or a team? Yeah. Well, honestly, I guess in two ways. As a, as a team, you know, again, we didn't, we didn't know each other before. Um, and we went from literally not knowing of each other mm-hmm. to working together on a side project. And so we met each other in like June of two, 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 2000, what know, 2011. Nine, eight? Yeah, nine, two, no, 2011. 20, 11, 11, yeah. Uh, June 2011. Yeah. By October, we formed the formed the company, and then that month we moved to San Francisco for four months as part of this incubator program. We were living together, oh, working together, like got spending it. all time together. So that was just like learning each other's quirks and like you know who gets up early, who stays up late. Is sure. so that was just like, <laughs> and again, I think in hindsight, honestly, we complement each other extremely well. Mm-hmm. So me and I are very different people, yeah, but we have very different strengths. But fundamentally, I think we're both. Uh, just down to earth people who are you know want a practical and get shit done, and I think that that worked well. Mm-hmm. So that was on like the <clears> team <throat> stuff. It just it, we we did gel even though it was so different. Mm-hmm. Um, on the business side, I mean, to your point, you, like the first couple months or years of building a, a software business, a lot, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors to be honest. You're like you're trying to build a software product that people are comparing to Gmail or yeah. like like really well established built products. And it, of course, does not function well at the time. No. Like, the big issue for us is that you know, things would crash all the time. We'd build features like Zvi and our co-founder, Jeff. What was amazing is in a night, they we would come up with a cool idea, they would build it, and we would launch it, like, in 12 hours. Wow. The, the downside to that is we'd launch it, but it would work 
pretty good, pretty well, but like still had bugs and issues sure. and whatnot. And like that's hard to scale at some point. You can't, yeah. That, you know, and I remember a couple of years in, we had just a ton of bugginess and issues, and that was probably the one of the hardest points in the company was you know, how do we unpack from that? Right. Uh, I think every any startup or any tech company, whether you're uh, ten people or a thousand people, is always just. How do you continue to develop it and refine it sure. and making sure that it's bug free, right? Well, there's there's yeah. two like conflicting forces, right? There's speed, right? Yeah. You want to get features in front of your customers as soon as possible, yeah. And then there's like quality and, and uh, to to push to ship code that will be bug free, like code it's impossible, right? Right, it, it's basically impossible. Like yeah. the code that gets closest to that is stuff when you send you know sending people to the moon or like heart surgery, yeah. like that stuff needs to be bug free. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not always bug free. <laughs> But like so- CRM software, like you can get away if it goes down. Yeah, sure, sure, right? sure, um, sure. But so, so we, we were straddling that line in the early days. It was speed, right? Mm-hmm. It was all about we need to compete with other products that have been in market for 10 years. Yeah. And eventually it became to, we've got customers, we've got revenue, people are actually starting to like what we've built. We need to double down quality. And, and at the, you know, the last couple of years, can actually, you know, I think people would say we were the best uh, brokerage or real estate CRM out there. Not because we had the most features. We stopped playing that game. Mm-hmm. It was because the features we had worked extremely they worked well. well. Um, and we focused on things that matter to most agents, right? Sure. We helped them nurture their sphere to win more business. Sure. And, um, yeah, so we, we shifted that over time. Sure. No, I mean, that's part of life. I get it. I mean, I remember it was a... F- I, I had cont- I, I, my credit card's still with you guys, but... We're still charging you? I, I think so. I, gotta, I have to look at that. I have to look at my statements, but I'm pretty sure it's still with you. You know, I had a... Scale mail was like a savior for us. You know, I yeah. love I love that that feature itself right there is is worth the uh, however you know hundred of hundred of dollars that we pay. But the you know sometimes I get it. You save a few, you save a draft in scale mail, and and the next morning you wake up to edit again, and the edits weren't there. I mean, I get it. There's sure. you know things happen, but that's just that's just part of life. And um, you know, I think the most interesting concept for as far as brokers are concerned, from our standpoint. Uh, and, and I want your opinion on this is other brokerages, whether it's a Corker or Element or Sotheby's, the, 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 our competitors, our industry colleagues, they don't have an in-house engineering team. So mm-hmm. what they have to do is they have to hire, let's just say, a third-party company to build out their CRM or sure. hire uh, somebody in the past, like you guys, to build something out. And if there's a bug, they have to rehire that company again. Sure. And there's paperwork, there's processes, there's communication, there's lag time on emails. Uh, it just takes so much longer. Um, what 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 do you say about that type of model now yeah. that you're here with us? So a couple of thoughts. One, you know, there definitely were brokerages over the years, many brokerages who would say to us, why would I pay you guys mm-hmm. at a monthly or annual fee for all of my agents when I could just build this ourselves? Oh. Right. We got that all the time. And we were like, well, and, and frankly, to, to your point, actually, a lot of brokerages do have small engineering teams. They don't have hundreds of people. They might have, you know, a dozen developers, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Uh, and I think what brokerages really, I think, it's not even a brokerage thing. What companies underestimate in general is that simple-looking software, uh, it looks simple purposefully, but it doesn't mean it's, like, simple on the back end. Like, no. it's very complex to build and get right. Um, and so, you know, companies try, and to your point, they'll hire this third-party team or they'll have their own small team. They'll build something. And they'll try to do what we did over seven years in six months. Yeah. And it doesn't work well. It breaks or they hire us with this offshore team. They've got to go back and try to fix the bug. It's, a, it's just a nightmare. Uh-huh. So I think most, you know, the best brokerages out there don't do not do that. They don't they don't try to build their own software anymore. Um, they, they buy the best software. Right. And that's that's what we, where we fit a niche, right? We, we went to the best brokerages and we said, look, we know your agents get the majority of the business from their sphere. Um, and we help them do that more effectively. So... By our software, and that resonated, and that's why eight of the largest twenty brokerages became our customers. Mm-hmm. Um, many of them still would integrate us with other software, right? so they would instead of trying to build a CRM, they would use their small engineering teams to uh, connect our CRM with transaction management software or you know whatever the software they're I using. See. And I think that's the model that works for most other brokerages, right? Mm-hmm. Who don't have the resources to have right. hundreds of engineers. Right. Compass is unique in that we. We actually can build out software that's more custom built for our agents' needs, and it's exciting, you know, as a software founder, being in an environment where, you know, finally the broker a brokerage is always going to know their agents best, 
Mm-hmm. And theoretically, if you had the resources, it's the best model if you could, you know, have that software really built for what your agents need. Um, and I, you know, Compass is the only brokerage I'm, I'm aware of that actually has the resources and has the team to to do it right, right. to actually build the software that's going to work well. Right. And we're and we're not perfect. Right. We've got a long ways to go as a company. Um, but it's exciting to be to be part of a brokerage of, of our scale for sure. Let's before we deep into the brokerage part of it, you created the company, you guys founded the company, you got up to 75 employees. Yeah. What, can you give us a, a, can you give any business leader, entrepreneur advice on how to scale that type of work or how to handle that type of work? I mean, we have listeners that are real estate brokers but also uh, professionals or entrepreneurs. Uh, They are all wanting to grow a team. What kind of advice can you give from that experience? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a broad question. I think you know I'm I'm fond of saying the people who start companies are often not the best people to scale and manage companies and hire right mm-hmm. like because I think it's just a different beast. Like in candidly, like I'm I'm a type of person who's really good at building stuff from scratch mm-hmm. and building small teams, um, and it was a big learning curve for me to figure out. Well, we're hiring senior executives now and I'm building these large teams. How do we empower them to be successful versus just like you know, I'm going to execute this myself. And you can't be the, the micromanager and dictator yeah, totally. at all. It's, just, it's a totally different skill set. And sure. frankly, everything you've learned that were made you successful at doing something when you're three people or five people, it's a totally different skill set when you're 50 or 75. Sure. So that, that for me was the big like macro lesson learned was to, to have the humility and the awareness to understand that that is just a different, it's a totally different job. Mm-hmm. And frankly, as the founder and COO of a company that grew at that, to that scale, my, my job and what I needed to do changed every year. Mm-hmm. Right? I had essentially a different job every year. Mm-hmm. And by the end, my job was all about uh, how do I empower my teams to work well together and be effective versus anything that I was individually doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found that rewarding. Very different. Yeah. But, but that, that's probably the biggest takeaway for me. Got it. When you found it contextually, uh, stepping away from the actual growth, but the, the vision, it... You weren't focused on real estate brokers, right? I, I personally can't even remember. I was definitely probably an earlier client, but I don't remember how I got introduced to contextually, but it fit well. I felt like it fit well, but I also felt as a user, you guys weren't maybe just catering to real estate people. You probably catered to small businesses, yeah. lawyers, maybe doctors. I'm not quite sure, but there's various templates for different types of sayings yeah. and occasions. Um, do, what was your concept when you guys first started what, if it wasn't just for real estate people yeah so Contaxi is an 8 year old or was an 8 year old company mm-hmm. right? we've been yeah. around for a while yeah yeah I know. And, I, and, I, and I alluded to this at the start but we we set out with the goal of how do we help people build stronger relationships with people they already know like the very like you know generic uh, focus right? mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not an industry focused thing but, but the whole thought was no one is Everyone knows that networking is important. Yeah. Everyone knows that you should stay in touch with people professionally yeah. that matter to you. Most people don't do it well. Um, right. And so we wanted to help fix that with software. Mm-hmm. What we found is that we built a pretty, you know, a, a, a industry agnostic product, like anybody could use it. And realtors started coming to us in droves, right? And which sort of makes sense, right? If you ask yourself, the market spoke. Like who who needs to engage their network? Who actually is going to make money from doing that? Yeah. It's people in services businesses, or people who are selling to their networks, selling yeah. their selling themselves, yeah. which tend to be, you know, lawyers, consultants, financial services, uh, exactly. And all those customers came to us. The reality is there are more realtors than any of those other groups. Yeah. So that sort of stood out to us. Like we're getting lots of two million brokers. Interest. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it became at some point, it started as a minority of our business. Eventually, became the majority of our customers. Got it. And we waited way too long to focus. I wish we would have focused years earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, but eventually, we're like. Why are we calling ourselves a? We call ourselves like a relationship marketing platform. We said like a CRM for small business. <laughs> Eventually, we're like, no, we're a real estate CRM, uh-huh. and we're the best real estate CRM. And Got that's it. Why. And that that was a turning point for us, and really a lot of like, of our later success was due to that focus. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So fa- let's just fast forward to two thousand. Uh, was it two thousand eighteen? Early two thousand eighteen, maybe late. I don't know this full story, but maybe late two thousand seventeen. Uh, how did you get approached and by... Compass came in the picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, talk about when Compass sure. first came into the picture. Sure. So, um, so Zvi and I were looking back through old emails. I think Zvi had gotten connected to Robert like four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. So, so we um, were already pretty focused on real estate then, not the exclusive focus, but sure. customers. So we'd gotten to know Robert. He knew about us. Uh, late 2017, 
Robert and the team approached us and said, hey, we were thinking of, uh, we'd love to explore maybe behind you guys. We said, no, 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 we're not interested. <laughs> uh, and, and they said, well, okay, well, let's, a lot of our agents use you and love you. So yep, let's figure out that's true. if there's something more we can do here. Um, and we said, well, we, work, we sell a lot of brokerages. Um, we'd love to sell to you guys. You should buy contactually for your agents. Uh, Compass, because we've got such a large engineering team, it, we ended up structuring a deal where it wasn't just buying licenses off the shelf. Yeah. It was actually buying licenses to leverage our API, mm-hmm. right, our, our backend like, infrastructure and code, to build a custom version, essentially, of Contactually for internal to Compass. So the Compass CRM that we started to build was actually powered, a lot of it was powered by Contactually. Um, so we worked really closely with the engineering team, the product team, the leadership team to build out that CRM, build a lot of the functionality that can actually in Compass CRM. Um, so that was late 2017 through yep. the first half of the year in, of 2018, not even, I guess, all of 2018. By the end of 2018, it became clear to everybody that, um, you know, we liked working with the Compass team. The Compass team really respected and appreciated working with our engineering team. And it felt like a no-brainer that maybe we should tighten this relationship as not a customer and company relationship but as a an acquisition relationship um so we started talking to robert in more depth and i mean ultimately the that felt like the deal made sense and mm-hmm. so we agreed to it um and since then it's been you know talking to robert our relationship talking to our team it's been it has been a good match i think that experience we had previously working together um, gave us the confidence that it would work mm-hmm. and it ultimately did so was it uh was the approach uh, to your team when you decided to pull the trigger was that something that was nervous for you was it more of a, a an opportunistic conversation with everybody how was it how was it received yeah so um let's say over so mix is probably the candidate sure it was mixed um you know there were about 40 people who joined compass from the contactual team and as you said we were 75 so not everybody came on sure board. um and I think what became clear through the process was primarily Compass was interested in our the product that we built and the team who had built it. Um, Compass does not sell software. So no. we had a lot of teams who sold software. We had salespeople, we had sure. marketing people, yeah. customer success people. Yeah. Um, and though there just wasn't a one-to-one natural fit for all of those teams inside of mm-hmm. Compass. And so um, you know, some of those folks we found good roles for within Compass, right? We have sales teams. They, they don't sell software, but we have sales teams. Sure. Um, we have, we, so we had some matches that we could do there. Um, but there were ultimately some people who just didn't feel like there was a match given where they were trying to drive their careers mm-hmm. and um, what the roles were at Compass. And mm-hmm. that, those were hard conversations. These were people that Zvi and I cared a lot about. That, sure, they're you know, family. Were, were, exactly. They 75, were board. 75 people in, a, in an office is like a, it's, it's a family. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, that was, that's what I mean by it was mixed. And there it. were a lot of people who ultimately weren't there at the end when we joined Compass. Uh, many people found obviously, obviously awesome roles at other companies. Um, I think it was the right move ultimately for the company. Mm-hmm. I think the people who joined Compass, uh, they're super excited and love what they're doing. Good. Um, but it was, you know, that there was a it was a hard process to go through. I think that's true probably for any acquisition. I mean, when you first started, I mean, uh, this may be this may be the case for some founders or some founders of some tech companies. But was was a buyout or an acquisition ultimately your goal when you first started, or was that that was not even in the vision? Like, yeah, let's I, not get bought out. Let's just it organically growing for 20 years and that, that was well, I don't well, know I, where you I think there's like this well there's I guess three outcomes to a business right mm-hmm. the most likely is you die <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. like, well, 90% chance of failure <laughs> uh, but then I think so we, we raised capital you said we raised 12 million dollars yeah. when you start to raise capital like that you start to put yourself on a path toward your investors want a return. Oh, yeah. The only way they're going to get a return is if the company is either IPOs mm-hmm. or you sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the ultimate goal of any founder is you, know, you want to build this as, re- as big as you can. All right? it's, that's why you're raising capital to yep. accelerate the sure. growth. Sure. Um, and so an IPO is always the goal, right? To, to be the, you know, that's be the check the box, public company, and then we feel like we've, you've reached whatever goals you have. Obviously, we didn't get to IPO. We, we, we sold before that. So I think that was always, it was either death or IPO. Mm. Right? Those were the two outcomes. That's right. If it wasn't, sorry, sorry, death or acquisition, if it wasn't IPO. Sure. Um, and since IPO, we didn't do it, it was acquisition. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, the, 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 we had made the choice by raising capital early on to not like grow organically forever. I do think about, you know, candidly, I, I, w- I plan to start another company again. And would I raise a lot of capital up front again? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think no. there's a lot to be said for, ra- for growing more slowly but to have sort of maybe a much longer term horizon, you know, growing a company for 20, uh, 30 years, sure. I think could be really appealing. Sure. So who knows? Maybe, maybe who I'll be able to do it differently the second time around. Okay. 
Oh, great. Uh, and I'm just, I know you're running out of time, so I just want to switch gears. But let's talk about what we're doing today. And sure. Your new sure. role, uh, your new role as basically a uh, the, the growth. You're responsible for our growth. Yeah, the right. our, our agent, agent growth. Yeah, so yes. you know we're talking about, you know, we call our strategic growth teams. Yep. Those are the teams that basically convince agents to join us, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're they're bringing in the new revenue. Yeah. But That's at it. this point, we've got what thirteen thousand agents plus at Compass today. And I think what keeps Robert and Michael and myself awake, what keeps us awake at night is how do we make those agents more successful? Right. right? Like, and, and that's what my team tries to do, right? What are the programs that we can develop and scale and make effective for our agents that will help bring in more money? So one of the things that we initially built out was a Compass lead program, right? We get traffic to the website. There are various lead partners that we can work with. How can we build up the infrastructure and partnerships to drive really good buyers and sellers to our agents? Mm-hmm. So we build a lot of that initial infrastructure. Um, and we got to a point now where it's, it's working pretty well. The bigger focus, as you all, as, as we all know, the company now is, is concierge, right? How can we help our agents double their listings? Um, this is a big, it's a big uh, goal. And so my team is responsible for, with, with concierge and with student bridge loans that will be launching very shortly, uh, what's the go-to-market strategy for that, right? How do we enable and train and educate our agents on how to pitch concierge and uh, how do we drive adoption in all of our markets. So the goal is um, in order for our agents to you know, double listen to these programs, they need to be comfortable with them, they need to be aware of them, and that's uh, my team and I help to drive. For what are the for the programs that we have, concierge and bridge loans, yeah. do you are you finding it on a national level? I know what we see in New York, but on a national level are you finding it that the brokers are actually winning more listings? Or they're actually their listings maybe not have doubled yet, but have slowly kind of been on that right trajectory. Uh, Asians are absolutely winning more listings. Great, it's, it's it's amazing to see. So there's a couple, there's a couple of benefits. First of all, when you go to a pitch that's competitive, right? The, the potential sellers. Yes, six you brokers work. talking exactly, calling up their leg. If you can say, you know what, you've got your home today, but I can literally give you. A, a loan, no string, no no interest, no, no strings like, attached. Exactly. Um, spend that money on whatever you think is gonna. Well, I'm frankly whatever you want, right? What and and we'd recommend you spend it on things that'll let you sell that home, make some improvements. Like there's the basic staging stuff, you know, painting, put furniture in. But what about like redoing the kitchen? What about like redoing floor? Like doing some really major stuff that frankly no other brokerages would put money to let you do. Nope. Um, that's a game changer for that listing because it's gonna sell faster and at a higher price point. And it's a game li- game changer for the agent because they're going to win that list, mm-hmm. right? Like, why wouldn't you take those? Did you have you do you have any uh, stories or interesting stories that you heard from brokers? I, maybe maybe out in, in you know we're in a cocoon in New York, so we're not really yeah sh- yeah. You know. So um, I hear all kinds of stuff, like different stories here and there of like someone putting in you know twenty k improvement and they sell for like eighty k more than they thought they would. Wow! So like we hear those stories a lot. That's great. Um, I think the stories that really stick with me. Yeah. Um, and, and again, we, you know, we've evolved the model now where it's like you don't have to use concierge for, for just certain types of improvements. You can literally, whatever will win the listing, we'll, we'll, you can use the money for it. Right. We had this one, um, I'm going to mix the, the, the details a little bit, but it's it was just a seller in New York. I think it was the sister of a, of a man who got really sick. I think he had cancer and was like, uh. you know, not that it was death was imminent mm-hmm. and um, she was trying to figure out what, well, what do I do with his home he couldn't take care of himself he moved into a hospice and um, you know all these medical bills are cropping up and, and then long story short it was like well, what, what do we do we can't, actually can't make the mortgage payments on this house anymore mm. uh, we use concierge to make the mortgage payments while wow. we can sell this home and then obviously pay the back loans and it, hearing that it's like wow here was this like family in crisis right like they, they, they can't like, afford the monthly they carrying they costs. Afford, yeah, exactly. This person's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of medical bills, um, and like the family doesn't know what to do. And we were able to step in, not just win the list. I mean, we won the listing, obviously, and, and you know the agent made their commission. But we actually like helped this family and helped them sell our home when they would have been screwed otherwise. It's better that they make a little profit than the bank take over. Yeah, totally. And right. like even just telling it now, like I, I get I mean, my my skin's like flushing. I get like emotional it's thinking great. about it. It's, yeah. Like that's where. I don't think we talk a lot about those stories um, as a company because it's not that's not the normal use case, obviously. Yep. But um, that's the type of impact that I think concierge actually has for a lot of the the families that are leveraging it. Mm. Right? It, it is. It not only will help you sell faster at a higher price point. That is true. People make more money when they use concierge, um, but it actually unlocks situations that wouldn't even be possible for these families otherwise. That. 
tell us a situation, maybe for some of the brokers that are listening, for a seller that doesn't have a ton of equity, is it still worth using concierge? Because every, not to, to drive the point home, yeah. not every seller bought 20 years ago. Sure. Right? And some sellers bought in 2007 or maybe in the height. Uh, have you seen any cases from brokers where concierge was utilized or maybe not utilized or were convinced to utilize, um, you know, for, you know, for that type of, uh, you know, purchase or sell? Yeah, so in, sell. in general, and obviously our, as the program has evolved, we sort of change our requirements for the, you know, what's sure. going to be automatically approved versus not. Mm-hmm. Um, the, whatever loan that comes to concierge needs to be backed by at least, I think it's two or three X of equity in the home. Yeah. Right? We want to make sure that you know, you've got... When the home sells, you've got money to repay. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't want to set a put, set a seller up for failure. No. Right? Um, but other than that, I mean, like, that, it, like so that's the, I would say the one like check the box, make sure that there is enough equity in the home to sure. support paying back the mm-hmm. loan. Because right. this is a loan. Right? This is not. This is not. It's free not money, a free right? money. Right. right. It's a loan. <laughs> that's the it's, it's an interest free loan. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that's uh, that's maybe the one consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, but we see, uh, I have seen people use concierge for you know all types of homes, super large luxury homes to. No random condos in, in that are not you know a couple hundred thousand dollars like mm-hmm. it, and I've seen anywhere from you know five ten thousand dollar concierge project to hundreds of thousands so it it does span the spectrum and a lot of times I hear I actually don't hear so much the you know is there enough equity in the home I hear a lot of conversation in the luxury market around oh my sellers you know they they have a lot of money they don't need concierge. they don't care yeah that, I heard that too and I, I've been there. I just think that I I can understand that pushback. I think the reality is that, again, concierge is so much more, right? We are literally, any any obstacle that's getting in the way of you selling your home, like, we will fix. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the real message that we should be enabling our agents to, to articulate when they're speaking to these potential sellers. And it's not like you don't have the money to put here. It's like, think of the opportunity cost of money that you have. Like, why would you spend your, your use your money, uh, liquidate whatever assets you need to, to uh, make these repairs in the home or do whatever with? Right. Like, leverage is... Free money, and or, or frankly, like think, take advantage think, of it. Figure, yeah, take, exactly, take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, the way I like to think about it for the luxury market is, uh, think of us as literally like the Four Seasons. I was talking about our salesman just today, Stan. He was like, "You stay in the Four Seasons." Uh, he he gave a story where like he always cleans his shoes, and he left his shoes out, and they like did something special extra to like clean his shoes, and like he didn't ask them to do that. Like they just noticed this is a guy who likes to keep his shoes clean, and they just did it. And I think it's the same thing with concierge, like. You work with a compass agent, sure, you may have the money to front to like make your repairs, but we will do whatever it takes to maximize, to do whatever you want to maximize the value of this home, to sell it quickly, to maximize the price, whatever. Um, and so work with us to help make that dream a reality. Yeah. Right? This isn't just like saving you a few bucks or like, you know, because you don't have the money. That's not the point. Yeah. So I, know, I think we, we it's good analogy. need to, to yeah. work a little bit on that, but yeah, think of us, think of your agent, your, your compass agent as like the ultimate concierge experience in the best hotel that's out there. Uh-huh. Like that's that's how we should be thinking. We're talking more about concierge. Got it, got it. Yeah, that's a great analogy. You're right. Yeah, it's above and beyond. Yeah, right. exactly. Uh, and then uh, just maybe we'll just talk a minute about, I know it's coming, but the bridge loan program as of yeah. uh, as of right now in, in September 2019. Uh, so it's it's come. So we, we haven't done, there's been a handful of bridge loans that we've done as a company so far. Yeah. The biggest reason for that is we didn't have a lending partner that we could mm-hmm. partner with. Um, that is now coming together. So we've that partner is in the final stages of like right the finalizing, line to yeah. Finalize, um, and the goal is to launch it. Can launch it in September. Good. Um, in uh, I believe a couple of markets. Some first pilot agents, you know, make sure the kinks are out. Yeah. And go nationally in Q four. I forget if it's in October, or November, but it's we're rolling. I mean, mm-hmm. we've heard from agents um, that you know this is much like um, concierge was one of those programs where you know this will help us win listings. We're confident that bridge loans will also help our sellers win listings. Sure. Um, and you know, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if Robert would be uh, would love for me to describe Compass this way, but I'll do it anyway because I think it's just a good analogy. Mm-hmm. I think of Compass like the Yankees. Yeah. Right? What, what, what the Yankees do really well is they take capital and they deploy it to get the best talent inside. And when you have the when you have the best cap talent, the best capital, like it just feeds itself. Right. Yeah. You get the best team as a result. Yeah. Kind of Compass is on the same thing, but com- but we do extremely well as a company. It was we um, because we built this like positive flywheel. And we have such high growth. We're able to bring really cheap capital in the company, and we can deploy this capital in really innovative ways. Right, concierge is a good example of that, and bridge loans would be another great example of that. Mm-hmm. And that um, you know other brokerages can't do it, can't not do that. 
Um, and I think it's going to be a, just like I, I think it will be as big as Costco. It's a great analogy. A, it's a great analogy. In terms of a, a, a tool for it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, the Yankees are. I'm not a personally Yankee fan, but they I'm not are. Either, they are play, they're yeah. They're playoff bound, so <laughs> you know, there's some respect there. Yeah. Yeah. They're always winning. Right. Consistently winning. Well, great, man. I, I don't want to waste up too much of your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Uh, do if you want to say a few things just to close off for our listeners, uh, you know, please go ahead. If not, please. yeah. Look, I, first of all, I appreciate you having me on yeah, the show. Absolutely. Um, I as I would say that what I I'll wrap up with two things. One, as someone who's a built and scaled a company, it's really cool and exciting and inspiring, frankly, to be part of a company like Compass that is so high growth mm-hmm. and um, so innovative in a lot of things that we're doing. Like I, I, you know, I think whenever you sell your baby and join another company. Yeah, I have not had a, a boss in almost a decade, right? And it's so <laughs> weird. To, it, was, it was weird to think about like what that's going to mean for me and for our team. Yeah, um, Compass has been a great home, and um, I'm I am genuinely excited by the challenges that we have ahead of us, and how do we how do we help our agents make more money? How do we grow more rapidly? Like those are big problems. So I think it's exciting, and I've really enjoyed the transition. Um, I think the other, the other thing I'd end with is if people have. You know, given my world right now is all these agent growth programs, lead gen, concept, sure. bridge loans. If anyone listening at Compass has feedback or concerns, like please reach out. Uh, my email is just tonyc at compass.com. I would love the feedback and would love to, to chat anytime. Tony TonyC at compass.com. Tony, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, talk to you soon.